Good morning. It is lovely to see you all this morning. So we begin our worship with our call to worship. Sing aloud to God our strength. Shout for joy to the God of Jacob. Raise a song, sound the tambourine, the sweet lyre, and with the harp, and also with the organ. And so we stand to sing. It's number 365 in the hymn book and on the screens. sit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us together as your family in this place. We thank you for the incredible privilege that we have to call you Father because of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Thank you that you draw us into that intimacy of relationship that relationship that means we can come to you as brothers and sisters, regardless of our age and our status, but all equal in your family. Lord, we thank you for the many blessings that you've given us over the past weeks. We thank you for the warmth of our homes, for the love and friendship that surrounds us, we thank you for the food that we're able to eat, the food we eat alone, and the food that we share. We thank you for the conversations we have, for the things that we learn on life's journey, for the way that we earn our living through work, for the way we have time to learn at school and college. 
Lord, we thank you for the blessings of the scenery around us, the sound of the birds, the sunrise and the beautiful sunsets. Lord, so often we are oblivious to the blessings that you give us. Open our eyes, open our ears, open our minds and open our hearts to see your goodness and your provision for us. And Lord, as we recognise how good you are to us, so we realise just how often we fail in terms of our human families, our human friends, our human church family, our colleagues. Lord, forgive us for the times when we have thought unworthy thoughts, for the times we've said spiteful and hurtful things, for the times when we have forgotten to give words of encouragement. Forgive us for the things that we have done wrong knowingly. Forgive us for the times we have knowingly neglected to do something right. Forgive us for the times when we have failed you without even thinking about it. So Lord, help us to focus on you this morning. Help us to draw closer to you. Forgive us for all our failings. Open our eyes so that we may see your way and guide our feet so that we may walk in our way. Direct our hands so that they may work for you. Guard our mouths so that they may speak words of love and encouragement. So, Lord, we lift these and all our prayers up to you, our Lord, our Father, our Saviour. Amen. Today, I said a bit earlier on, we're looking at holy habits, which is the ten habits of the early church. And we've looked at serving, we've looked at prayer, we've looked at biblical teaching, and just before Christmas, rightly so, generosity and gladness. And today, we are starting to look at eating together. Now, I know everybody's on diet, well, some people are on diets after Christmas, and I know Lent is coming up, etc. But we are going to concentrate on feasting and eating together for the next two months. Because food is so important. We absolutely need food to live. If you haven't got food and water, you've got very, very little. But food has a real social element too. And food can be fair and food can be unfair. Now... I found this in the church hall. This is left over from Christmas. Did anybody get selection boxes at Christmas? Yeah, you did. Brilliant. Well, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six here. Who'd like a chocolate bar? Erin, you were up first. Kathleen, <laughs> you were second. Kathleen, you got one? Lots and other people can have nothing. 
And that's hardly fair, is it? But I want you to know, in children's church, that there is another set of boxes on the table. Okay? <laughs> so those of you who didn't get a chocolate first time round, get first dibs on the chocolates that are left. Okay, so you won't miss out in the end. But food can be like that. <clears throat> food can be really unfair. And the Bible story that we're looking at today is the story of a famine. Hunter, you are a good baker, so come over here. This man's lemon drizzle cake is to die for. Right. There is a great story in the Bible about... One thousand and eight from Mission Praise. The Lord's my shepherd.
enjoy children's church, and don't forget the chocolates. Some of you will remember about the holy habits, but some of you might have missed one or two of them. So I thought it was worthwhile to go back and think about the holy habits that we've looked at. What we're doing is following a course that looks at the way the early church lived, the things that were important in their life together. And we've looked at serving how the early church served each other and how by extension we go on to serve those around about us. And we looked at prayer. Prayer is one of those things that sometimes people find very difficult. What do we mean by prayer? What, does, what happens when we think our prayer hasn't been answered? Is my prayer better than your prayer? Do we have to pray in the same way? And then we've looked at biblical teaching. What does it mean to be serious about reading the Bible, about trying to understand what the Bible is saying to us? It's not always easy because parts of the Bible are nearly 3,000 years old, other parts are 2,000 years old. How do we read it today? How do we apply it today? And, of course, before Christmas, <clears throat> we did gladness and generosity. <clears throat> so today, we're looking at a new habit, which is the habit of eating together. Now, it's not necessarily easy to see all the detail on that little um, chart that's up on the screen. So I will send it out as a picture when I send out the emailing and the WhatsApp group. But right in the centre, you've got eating together. And it says eating together is particularly conducive to practising or exploring the other holy habits. And then it's got, on the top left-hand corner, it's got worship. And there's a link between worship and biblical teaching. And it says, biblical teaching can be shared around a meal table in a variety of ways. Cafe church, messy church, <coughs> alpha, and worship too can be offered in these contexts. And we'll look a little bit more about that in the address today. And then we've got breaking bread in the top right-hand corner. Breaking bread began around the meal table. Of course, we remember the Passover meal. And eating together fits naturally into that context. And then coming down the side, it's got prayer. Prayers of thanksgiving, intercession and blessing fit particularly during or after a shared meal or when eating alone. And then fellowship. Fellowship deepens and grows around the sharing of food and stories. And I'm sure that you have found that too. And then at the bottom, it's got serving in blue, gladness and generosity, and sharing resources in green. Providing meals for the lonely, the housebound, the homeless, or families on low incomes is an outworking of sharing resources, serving, and generosity. The meals can be a source of gladness to those who partake. And of course, food offered in the context of a party or celebration gladdens the heart, doesn't it just? And then the last one is making more disciples. For those who come to faith through initiatives such as Alpha or Messy Church, eating together may well be foundational and essential in their discipleship journey. 
So that's how all the habits are interlinked, interlinked and there may be other linkages between them as well. And that's what we're going to look at in a little bit more detail later on. But first, we're going to have two Bible readings. The first reading is taken from 1 Kings, chapter 17, verses 1 to 16. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here. Turn eastward and hide in the Kerith Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kerith Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Some time later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Sarapath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Sarapath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? <coughs> As she was going to get it, he called, and bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sets rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the Lord, the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. The second reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 15, verses one to nine. Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name. For in perfect faithfulness you have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. You have made the city a heap of rubble, the fortified town a ruin, the foreigner's stronghold a city no more, it will never be rebuilt. Therefore strong peoples will honour you, cities of ruthless nations will revere you. You have been a refuge for the poor, a refuge for the needy in their distress, a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm driving against a wall and like the heat of the desert. You silence the uproar of foreigners as heat is reduced by the shadow of a cloud. So the song of the ruthless is stilled. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples. The sheet that covers all nations, he will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day, they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord, we trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We 
would stand to sing again 407, 407 in the hymn book. All things come from you, O Lord, and of your own do we give you. Bless now these gifts, bless those who give so freely, and bless the work these gifts support. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts and minds be found acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, before I came into church this morning, I was out feeding the birds. Now, I cannot tell you what pleasure I get from feeding the birds or what a specialised diet they have. They don't just get any cheap old stuff. They get the best. And then I mix in extra mealworms and extra suet pellets and there's sunflower hearts and peanuts up. And I am richly rewarded because the birds come and they love it. And I get such pleasure from it. And I can even get, I'm training the new robin up to eat from my hands. Last year I had a robin that ate regularly from my hands. And this year I'm working with patients and we've done it a few times. I cannot tell you the pleasure I get from feeding the birds. It's lovely having something to give them, suitable food. But that's not what we're really talking about today. Me feeding them. What we're really talking about is eating together. That story of the widow of Zapareth. Such faith in God. Such trust in Elijah. God had set it all out beforehand the widow was there in the right place. She must have intuitively known because she was in Phoenicia. It wasn't instinctively, it wasn't naturally a place where the people of Israel would have been. But God's worked in her, a foreigner. She's in the right place 
at the right time. She trusts the words of Elijah when he talks of God. She makes him something to eat. And thereafter, there is always something for all of them to eat. He stays in that house and he is fed by her day in and day out. Now, when you read the pages of the Bible, you'll notice, if you look for it, that famine occurs so many times in the Old Testament. Food was so precarious in those days. Sometimes there was plenty. But if the crop failed, there wasn't cans of stuff in the back. There wasn't food that you could import from halfway across the world. There was always tension. Was there going to be enough for the end of this year and the beginning of next year before the crops came in? And if there was a drought, it was serious. There was no food. So people were very vulnerable. People were really dependent on the rains at the right time and the heat and the warmth at the right time. And we know that it's famine that drives the people of Israel into Egypt. You know, when they've sold um, Joseph into slavery and then there comes a time of famine and all of the family have to go down into Egypt to find something to eat. They were economic migrants. They were migrants who had to flee because of weather uncertainty going down into Egypt, which had plentiful provision. So famine and the movement of peoples because of famine is part of the biblical tapestry. And that's why it's so important that the other part of the picture is feast, famine and feast, and why the images of restoration are always given, or almost always given, as a great banquet, a place where people come together and have the richest of food. It's not just oil and meal, day after day, maybe lightened with a bit of spice, but certainly not a chicken or a piece of lamb. It's that very basic food, day after day after day, boring but essential. And this image of God's love, of God's restoration, is a great banquet. And we get that image in that passage from Isaiah. And it's a passage that's talking about restoration in Isaiah's time. But also, if you look carefully at the passage, it is also a picture of the restoration at the end of time, when death is swallowed up and when every tear is wiped from the eye. So you can see a direct link from Isaiah 25 through to the penultimate chapter of Revelation, what God has provided for his people. So you've got this image of heaven as a great banquet where everybody comes together and has the richest of food. And even in Psalm 23, you can see a trace of that where the Psalm says, you've set a table for me in the presence of my enemies and my head is anointed with oil and my cup runs over. It's not just metaphorical, it's absolutely, that's what plenty is, a vision of heaven. Food and oil and a table to sit down at. So our theme is food, but it's not just food. It's about eating together, and that's the difference. And eating together is more than just providing. It's not about me going out to feed the birds. It's about some form of equality, that we eat together together. Eating together sounds really simple, and I always think the Moravian Church is really good at that. We don't like to meet together without a cup of tea and a piece of cake. But it's actually, when you look at it, it's a little more in-depth than that. How do we eat together with folk we don't know? Or with folk who are shy? Or with folk we don't like? How do we provide food? How do we provide hospitality for those we are uncomfortable with? And how do we build relationships through sharing food? How do we cross cultures by eating together? When I was at Horton Moravian Church, and you've probably heard this story before, we had the youth club meeting in the church hall and the table um, football had 
gone wonky. I needed to go and borrow a screwdriver. So the church is set in a very Muslim area. So I went out of church, out the hall, to a house, borrowed a screwdriver, repaired the table, came back down, and returned the screwdriver. And the Muslim lady of the house had cooked an enormous bowl of chips for me to take back to the youth fellowship, which I did, and it was wonderful. It was such a lovely gesture. But thinking about this, I wondered, wouldn't it have been lovely if I'd invited her to come up and share it with us? You know, that little bit step further of saying, please come meet our youngsters and have these chips with us together. It's that little step further on. And then, of course, there's another aspect. How do we accept hospitality from other people? How do we feel about taking hospitality, recognising that it may take up time in a busy life? Do we feel that we haven't got time to stop for that cup of tea or coffee? Do we feel, no, we've got to rush on somewhere else? How do we feel about accepting hospitality? And how do we feel about supplying the needs of those who have less than us without making them feel awkward and without making us feel awkward or acting superior or gracious? Now, we're going to look at passages from the New Testament in other services. But we're just going to look at feast and famine and the practicalities of eating together here. Is hospitality second nature to us? And I have to say, it is lovely around here. And I love visiting because almost always you get offered a cup of tea and coffee and biscuits, often tray bakes and chocolate biscuits. And I'm going to say for anybody who comes around to our house, there are no tray bakes and there are no chocolate biscuits because if they come in, they get eaten. They don't wait for an honoured guest to come round. So you won't find them at my house. But you will find the kettle always on. But in hospitality, you never know who you're with. And you never know how you will be blessed by that act of kindness. Now, the widow was blessed because she and her son had food until the famine ended and they needed that supply no more. Out of her kindness, out of her trust and faith, she was supplied. And there's another lovely uh, paragraph in Genesis chapter 18. There's a great story about Abraham seeing three people coming along. And he says, come on in. You know, you can't keep traveling. You need to stop and rest and have something to eat. What I love about that passage, not only is Abraham's generous generosity, but it isn't Abraham that actually has to go and get it sorted. It's his wife, Sarah, in the back tent who goes out and gets the meal ready. But it is this lovely image of offering food hospitality to people you don't know. And through that, of course, they get told about the birth of the son that they've longed for, the son called Isaac. He laughs. Hospitality can be such a blessing to those who offer it. And hospitality restores relationships. Do you remember how COVID destroyed those simple acts of hospitality? We couldn't meet up with each other. We couldn't move out of our homes. And even a little while later on, we were really uncomfortable about sitting down and eating and drinking in each other's homes. And it took such a while to rebuild that. And I remember Raymond persuading us to have a St. Patrick's Day supper. And it was with that shared meal that everybody was invited to, that those bonds of, the mental bonds of restriction got broken in, it and we, in us and we got back to sharing slowly and gently. After that time, we got back to restoring fellowship and hospitality with each other. Because hospitality, eating and drinking, draws people in. You get to know folk, and I know there's some folk that have to go straight after church, but you do actually get to know people when you're sat down with a cup of coffee after church. And it's no coincidence that the popularity and the success of Alpha in drawing people into the Christian faith is the meal that the people have before the meeting starts. 
Because people realise that the Christianity they're being told is not just an abstract concept. It's not just about a God they can't see and a Jesus who did something for them many years ago. It's also relational. It's about meeting other people who have that faith and that trust. The relationship that's built up is at the heart of it. And meals are at the centre of messy church. If you have youngsters who are involved in that, there's always something simple to eat at the end of it. It might be um, oven chips and fish fingers. And of course, it's at the centre of cafe church, isn't it? Where you might meet up in a costa, or you might have um, a cafe church style service here in church. And love feasts actually come out of that the love feast started when food was sent into church because the people had been in church in Berthelsdorf praying for so long that they needed something to eat and drink. And love feasts became an integral part of Moravian worship. Now, they weren't always as formalized as we had them. And I know that love feasts can be very difficult to do. And love feasts on a Sunday afternoon attracted only a very small number of folk to come them come to them. But how do we revive that Moravian tradition of love feasts, of eating together as part of the context of a church service? And there's lots of imaginative ways to do love feasts. And of course, meals, as we've outlined in terms of the passage from Isaiah, are a way of celebrating weddings and baptisms and often folk will invite everyone from church to come and join them in the hall for soup and sandwiches and sometimes we're so shy that we tend not to go but I would say to you be bold go and accept the hospitality that's offered you can't say to yourself they don't mean me because yes when people make that invitation they mean everyone we are often so quick to give and yet so slow to receive. And it is no coincidence that a way of marking a celebration in the Bible is a feast. At the restoration of all things in Isaiah and in Revelation, there's a lovely phrase that says, blessed are those who are called to the marriage feast of the Lamb. That's that image of heaven being like the very best wedding that you've ever been to and it's no coincidence either that a ritual meal is a way of remembering is at the center of our faith we remember that that time Jesus took the bread and the wine was at a Passover meal and a Passover meal is a meal of celebration and we use bread and wine to symbolize what God has done for us how he has drawn us into his kingdom how he has released us from slavery, the bondage of sin. So food is part of our faith. It's not just a way of marking our differences, like keeping kosher, but a way of emphasising our togetherness. Eating together is a symbol and sign of the kingdom of God, where all are invited and where wealthy and poor sick and healthy, old and young and respectable and not so respectable, sit down and eat with the Lord, who is the host, and we are all equals. So we're going to be looking at eating together. We're going to be looking at ways that we can increase doing that as a church. And wherever you are, do offer hospitality. You don't know who you might be entertaining. And if you're offered hospitality, accept it graciously because we are all fellow travelers along the path we need to grow together and eating together is a wonderful way of doing that amen and we're going to stand to sing now and it's three three four let us build a house
Please sit. For some short intercessions. Lord, awaken in us our need of you. Make us hungry and thirsty for you as the living Lord, as individuals and as the church, the congregation gathered here, that we may serve you and serve others out of our love for you. Lord, we ask you to help us see the world as it really is, to see things through your eyes. And we pray for all the rulers and the governments of the nations. We pray for wisdom, for clear-sightedness, for compassion, and for a view to the future. We pray for those who are living in places of food shortage today. Those who live in war-torn areas. Yemen. Syria. Gaza. Those who live in areas where there's food shortages because of climate change and the actions of governments like Afghanistan. Those who live where food floods have washed away the soil and the seed. Those who live in drought areas where there's not enough food for irrigation. Lord, as we eat our own food this week, remind us of the need of so many for food in front of them, for clean water. May the meals we prepare and may the meals we share together be opportunities for drawing closer to you and to one another. And Lord, as we pray for all those who need medical treatment, so we pray for those who prepare food in nursing homes and residential homes, for those who prepare food in hospitals, for those who prepare food for people on the streets, for those who prepare food for all in need, we pray that that may be a blessing to them and to those who cook it and serve it. Oh Lord, we pray for the people we know who need your healing touch. We pray for those who care them for them as well. And Lord, we ask you to welcome into your eternity all who have spent their lives coming to you and now are approaching death. Lord, may they find in your mercy the marriage feast of the Lamb. So Lord, bless us this day as we continue together. And this we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our friend and our saviour. Amen. We stand for our last hymn.
remain standing for the Holy Habits Prayer. Endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. Gracious and ever-loving God, we offer our lives to you. Help us always to be open to your spirit in our thoughts, feelings, and actions. Support us as we learn more about those habits of the Christian faith, which as we practice them, will form us in the character of Jesus by establishing us in the way of faith, hope, and love. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with us and remain with us now and evermore. Amen.